All right, we mentioned yesterday all the, you know, getting a president elected, get a vice president elected, get the cabinet put together. And the thing that we concentrated on yesterday was the basic problems there was of organizing the federal government. We had no federal laws, we had no law enforcement officers, we had no court system to make decisions on matters of law. There was very little money in the new country. The nation owed a great big debt from the Revolutionary War. There was no method put together to collect taxes to raise any revenue. Even if we did, there was no place to put it because there was no federal treasuries. We had an incredibly weak military after the Revolutionary War, very vulnerable to attack, and we had no foreign policy. So we really were, we were independent, but that was about it. So that takes us to our next subtopic, which is Congress goes to work. And we'll tell you kind of some of the things they did to uh, get some of these problems solved. Now, remember we have a new Congress, right? 26 senators and 59 representatives. We have a president, a vice president, and a cabinet. Well, one of the first and most important measures that Congress adopted at this time was called the Judiciary Act of 1789. The Judiciary Act of 1789. One of the most important and first measures excuse me, that our Congress took in the history of this country is when they established the Judiciary Act of 1789. What does, what do you think that's doing? Yes, my dear? Uh, how do I spell that? It's not, on the, it's not on the ID sheet? Oh, is it? Right yeah, okay. It's all right, Judiciary Act of 1789. What's that have to do with as far as our problems we've talked about? <coughs> what do you think? <coughs> Court system, very good, my dear. Court system. Now, what the Judiciary Act of 1789 did is it established the first federal court system in America, okay? We had state court systems with the colonies, but we had no federal court system. So the Judiciary Act of 1789 would establish the first federal court system in America, okay? Now I'll give you uh, what this court system consisted of. It consisted of three things, okay? The first thing that the Judiciary Act of 1789 did is it established a Supreme Court. And at the time, it consisted of one Chief Justice and five Associate Justices. So, the United States, passed the, the United States Congress passed the Judiciary Act of 1789. It established the first federal court system in America. And it consisted of three things, the first being a Supreme Court. And on the Supreme Court, there was one Chief Justice and five Associate Justices. Second thing it established, and this is kind of top down, you might think you'd go the other way, but we're going top down. The second thing it did is it established 13 district courts. 13 district courts. One Supreme Court than 13 district courts. How does that shake out, Ivan? 13 district courts. Very well, states now, but you're right. One for each state. So each state is gonna have a district court. And the third thing it established were three circuit courts. Three circuit courts. C-I-R-C-U-I-T. Yes. Is that reserved for every state? No, we'll talk about that. That's a good question. Okay, so what's the bottom level? You start, in, okay, teacher, assistant principal, principal, superintendent, school board. That's a chain of command up. Okay, so Supreme Court, District Court, Circuit Court. Which one's the lowest one? Don't get fooled by the order I put in there. What's that? What would a district court be? A district, there's one in each state. What do you think a circuit court would be? One in each city? Yeah, that's not, that doesn't make sense, right? So if you go to district court and you don't like the decision, you would appeal to the circuit court. Would there be as many circuit courts as there are district courts? No. So the answer is, the I didn't put them in order. The circuit courts, they had three among the 13 states. There were three and they were spread evenly across the country. There was a circuit court in the southern part of the states, the middle part of the states, and the northern part of the states. Circuit courts. So if you had a disagreement with it and you went to your district court in your state and you appealed, you would appeal to the circuit court 
closest to your state, and if you didn't like the decision, then you would appeal to the Supreme Court. So that what is what the Judiciary Act of 1789 did. It'd have been less confusing if I'd have got an order, but in order, bottom down, they established 13 district courts, one in each state, then three circuit courts spread evenly across the country, one in the south, one in the middle, one in the north, and then one Supreme Court, and that Supreme Court had one Chief Justice and five Associate Justices. That was the top court of the land, which it still is today. So, anybody want to guess? Boy, somebody should know this. Who was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? Somebody better know it. Because you did a report on the person. You must not have paid much attention. Sheriff, throw him more Sheriff, who was the first Supreme Court Justice? Well, all right, we just be a magical. John Jay, remember the guy that negotiated what? The, the Revolutionary War, or was he in that? Yeah. Okay, John Jay was the first Supreme Court <coughs> Justice. Now, the Judiciary Act also gave the Supreme Court power over which states? All of them. All 13. Now, you've got to remember at this time in American history, people really believe themselves as citizens of individual states, not a federal system. So that's going to be a little bit shaky. And because of that, the federal government had to abolish each of the 13 states from having their what? Own but even bigger, government, okay? So you gotta remember, this is another job that's big, is that each state used to do it whatever they pleased, however they wanted to do it. They were not used to a federal system of government. And so the, the reason the Supreme Court was made was to abolish each of the 13 states from having an independent government, okay? Disputes would have to come to them. Now, why would they have to have each of the 13 states follow federal government laws? Because we just formed a pretty important document in this country that wouldn't work if they all acted independently. And what was that document that you'll learn more about next year? The United States Constitution. So, when the United States Constitution was formed, and it was formed prior to us handling all of these problems, it was important that these 13 individual states understand that they had to act as part of a federal government. If they did not, then our United States Constitution would not work. So, repeating that again, at this time in American history, people believed themselves as citizens of individual states, not a federal system. And so, because of this, the federal government had to abolish each of the 13 states from having an independent government. Now, would they have some say within their own states? But they could not be independent of the entire government, okay? And that was done because if everybody had their own way of doing things governmentally, the newly formed United States Constitution would not work, okay? So, we took care of the federal court system. We didn't have any courts, right? Now we're going to talk about our next subtopic, is how in the world are we going to pay that tremendous debt that we owe? So that will take us to the next subtopic, which is Congress deals with repaying the government debt. Okay? This is kind of an interesting story. Now, who is going to be the absolute person other than the president to deal with this debt on our financial problems? Who's that burden going to lie with? Alexander Hamilton, very good. Because what is he? Secretary of our Treasury. So, to find solutions to the new nation's financial problems, Congress is going to turn to the new Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. He would be responsible to devise a program that would put the nation's finances on sound footing. He will be responsible to come up with a plan. So to find solutions to the new nation's financial problems, Congress turns to the new Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, who would be responsible to devise a program or plan that would put the nation's finances on sound footing. Now, 
Hamilton had a philosophy, and he compared the nation's debt to that of an individual's debt. He knew that a nation, just like an individual, must pay its debts or you lose the trust of your neighbors, right? So if Morgan lends me $20 with the caveat that I'm going to pay him back in two weeks, if I don't pay him back, he's not going to trust, I or think I'm very trustworthy in that endeavor, and he's probably going to tell a couple of his buddies too, so to make sure they don't lend me any money. Well, that's what Alexander Hamilton felt. If we ignore our debt, countries are not going to trust us, and they're certainly not going to allow us to borrow any money, more money down the line. So he knew that a nation like an individual must pay its debts or lose the trust of its neighbors. Now, if you lose that trust, just like I talked with Morgan, if I lose that trust, if I borrow $20 from Morgan and I don't pay him back and I get in the jam a, a month later and ask him, he's going to say no unless he doesn't like his money very much. Okay? So you have to do that. Now, anybody want to guess what the war debt was the United States owed? And this is 1789. So think about this. Elise, how much would you, how many zeros you want to Six. Six more? How much is that? That's correct. That's what we owe. Eighty million dollars. Now that was just a staggering sum of money at that sum of money at that time. Yeah. That was $80 million in their time? Their time, yeah. Very good question. Staggering amount at their time. I'd hate to guess what that would be now, but probably eight hundred million. Or maybe a billion or maybe a billion and a half. I don't know. But it was I mean when you don't have any money, eighty million dollars is a lot of money. Now, this debt was broke up into three types of debt. And this is really important you know this. Three different types of debt. One was foreign debt. Which means what? Asia? What does foreign debt mean? Who do we owe that money to? Other countries. Other countries. Very good. The other part of that is domestic debt. So Josh, who do we owe that to? Say it. America. People in America that helped us out. And the third is state debt. Debt. And this one gets kind of important. What does that mean? What is state, uh, Delaney? What is state debt? We owe state debts. What's that mean? Like all the states have their own everything, so they money. That's perfect, my dear. So we owed money to foreign countries, foreign debt. We owed money to individuals within our 13 states that helped us in the war effort, which is domestic debt. And then you had certain states. <coughs> That we owed money to, I don't, I don't know which one, but like Pennsylvania, we owed Pennsylvania money because that state chipped in during the Revolutionary War. So there actually was three different types of debt, and Hamilton believed that we needed to pay them all back. Now I'm going to tell you what he proposed on each of these. We'll start with foreign debt. What Hamilton proposed to pay our foreign debt. By the way. Does anybody want to guess um, how much of that 80 million was owed to foreign countries? Anybody want to throw a guess on that? Do you think it'd be a large amount, small amount? What do you think? 50 million. Close guess. 12 million was owed to foreign countries. What countries? France, Spain, and the Netherlands. So you need to know that. So 12 million of the 80 million a foreign debt was owed to three foreign countries, France, the Netherlands, and Spain. Which tells you that most of the debt we owe is where? Within our own country. Okay, That might surprise people. That, the reason I said that one, that was a great guess, 50 million, because I, most people think, well, yeah, we certainly must owe the foreigners more. We actually owed more to our own people, so to speak. Now, here was... Secretary Hamilton's proposal to pay the foreign debt, the 12 million, owed to France, the Netherlands, and Spain. Similar to any other loan, the United States arranged to repay that over a fixed period with what? Interest, just like a loan. So the United States arranged to repay these foreign countries that we owed the 12 million to over a period of time, and we were going to pay them interest 
for their kindness in lending us that money. That's what a bank does to you, right? And you look for the lowest interest rate. I don't know what the interest rate was on this debt, but we agreed to pay it back over time with interest. Okay, domestic debt. This was money that was borrowed from individual Americans during the revolution. Forty-four million of domestic debt was borrowed from individual Americans during the course of the Revolutionary War. Now this is kind of an interesting story. How did, they, how did people lend us money? What did we sell them? Government bonds. Very good. We had government bonds kind of work like this. Okay, so I need some money. I'm a country. Dane's in my country. He says, you know what? I will buy government bonds. I will give you $100. I'll, I'll go back. I'll give you $89. And then after the war is over, over a period of time, I'm going to take that note in, and you're going to give me 100 for it. So he made 11 bucks. You can still buy those type of bonds, savings bonds in the same way. When we fought in World War I and World War II, we sold liberty bonds, where people did the same thing. You buy the bonds and give them the money, then after the war is over, you get paid back with some interest. Okay? Well, what happened is $44 million worth of uh, government bonds were sold during the Revolutionary War. So people sooner or later are going to come up and say, hey, here you go. Give me my money. Okay? Now, here is the kind of the weird thing about it. So, Congress borrowed money from Americans in the colonies by selling government bonds. Each bond was a promise that the loan would be paid back in time with interest. Well, a lot of people during the course of this war were thinking, ooh, things aren't going very well. Now, I just bought $7,000 worth of government bonds and we're getting our butts kicked. Okay? So, rather than lose the $7,000, i am going to sell mine, at least get half my money back, so I'm going to sell mine to, to Michaela for $3,500. And at least I'm going to recoup some of mine. And people panic. And these government bondholders, because the, you know our, our situation wasn't good, many of them sold their bonds for a fraction of what they were worth to someone else. What are those people called that take advantage of a situation like that or are willing to take the risk? They're called speculators. Okay, speculators are people that buy things when things are not so good and hope to make a profit. They take the risk because if this doesn't come about, right, they lose their money. But that's what happens. So because of the government's troubles during war, many of the bondholders sold their bonds for a fraction of what they were worth because they would at least get some of their money back, okay? Well, as I mentioned, most of the bonds were purchased by speculators hoping to make a large profit at a later date. They're taking the risk. Well, to be quite frank with you, when they talked about domestic debt, many members of Congress, Congress objected to paying back these speculators who didn't originally purchase the bonds. They said, you know, that's a bunch of BS. We're not going to do that, okay? Both for didn't buy that original bond. She didn't lend us the money. We're not going to pay her back. You know, if it's not an original bond purchaser, we're not going to do that. Well, Hamilton did not believe that. He believed strongly. You have to pay Michaela back. She paid 3500 bucks. Yeah, she probably took advantage of the situation, but we owe her that money. You know, we owe. we got to pay these bonds. Even though she makes a big profit, that's what we agreed to. Whoever bought the bond was expected to get paid back. And now Michaela's going to expect to get paid back as well, although she was smart enough to buy it for half price. So even though Congress didn't think they should pay back speculators, they should only pay back the original purchasers of the bonds, Hamilton believed that the bonds had to be paid off at their original value, no matter who held them or for what reason. Well, he convinced Congress that the nation's credit had to be established. And the only way we get our credit established is if we pay everybody back. So, the same case as the foreign debt issue, the United States arranged to repay individuals like Michaela over a fixed period of time with interest. 
Okay, same scenario. But does it make sense why they maybe didn't think they should pay? Now the third debt was the one that turned out to be kind of interesting. The remaining 24 million was owed by the United States of America to individual states, not any persons, the states. Because individuals lent money to states who then turned the money and lent them to the government. Okay? Now, picture this to me. The state debt came from people in the state. This is a state of AP US History 1. Okay? Casey lent the state money to give to the end of, you know, give to the government. So when the government collects this 24 million back, they're going to put it in a kitty and then they're going to give uh, Casey hers and Macklin his and Lauren hers. You understand that? Well, obviously this wasn't very even because some states owed a lot of money and a lot of other states didn't know any. And what Hamilton wanted to do is he wanted the federal government to assume the entire $24 million. Okay, he wanted them to assume the whole thing. So pay attention so you understand, it's a little confusing. Individuals lent states money during the Revolutionary War. Some states owed more money to their own citizens than other states. Okay? Alexander Hamilton wanted the federal government to assume the $24 million owed by individual states to pay back their own citizens. Well, would you think that was fair? If you think about that, would you think that was fair if, if, if the federal